presenting uh, this morning's event on keeping the grid stable in a high renewables market. And we've got a pretty impressive lineup of speakers today. Um, and uh, we'll be doing a Q&A towards the end. Um, I'll hand it over to Alexander Stafford MP, and he's going to give us our, our opening keynote. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you so much uh, for having me here today, albeit virtually, but we're getting used to this now. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to discussion and, and the presentations later on. But first, I'd like to give you a bit of background about me and why I'm interested in this. So obviously, my name is Daniel Stafford. I'm a Conservative Member of Parliament for Rother Valley which, for those who don't know, is basically South Yorkshire, the southernmost bit of Yorkshire, and a former Red Wall seat. Before becoming an MP in 2019, I worked in both the energy and the environmental uh, industries, first as head of UK media for the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, concentrating mainly on uh, energy and climate change, uh, and then more recently just for elected uh, for Shell, you may have heard of, on projects relating to the future of energy and transport. So for me, this is very much an important uh, issue that we need to be discussing. Uh, in my tenure so far as being an MP, I mean, I was elected to serve on the, the BASE, the Business Energy Industrial Strategy Select Committee, and we're currently in the process of inquiring the UK's net zero targets and the UK Climate Strategy uh, Summits. So the BASE Select Committee really does look at energy, hence why this discussion today is so important. So basically, the role of the committee is to ensure that the government is making good progress and remains on course to achieve our national target of net zero by 2050. We have inquiries, we raise issues, uh, and we have these points that we feel need more attention and do what we can to keep the government honest almost, keep them on track. So obviously this government is doing a very good job, but they need to keep on track. Uh, and this of course means there's been a lot of internal discussion about renewable energy and innovative, innovative technology. We've also been doing a lot of work to get the UK ready to host COP26 in Glasgow next year. I'm not sure if everyone is aware of here, but last week, uh, during a Bay Select Committee uh, session, the Bay's Minister, Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, confirmed the UK would use the presidency of both COP26 and the G7 to promote faster and better global climate change action. And that's obviously a fantastic thing. We, are, we as the government are trying to push forward a greener, cleaner agenda globally. And it really seems that despite uh, coronavirus, despite all the, the issues, this government is going to stay on the track and actually go further and faster when it comes to a greener energy system, which I think everyone will be very pleased about. Now, the net zero energy system of 2050 will look very different to that of today. We will no longer burn coal, oil and gas to generate electricity in a domain and power industrial processes. Cars will no longer run on petrol and diesel and our homes will no longer be heated on natural gas. Obviously, there will be exceptions to that. There's going to be historic cars, historic things which you can't uh, decarbonise. But as a whole, the average person's life when it comes to energy will look very, very different from what we see today. And that is obviously a great thing. Uh, by 2050, most of our electricity will be generated from renewable sources. Many industrial processes will switch to electricity. Most of our cars will run on batteries. And many of our homes will be heated by electric heat pumps. However, and this is something I want to put through as a challenge into the room, uh, is electrification is not the whole answer. Because some industrial processes cannot simply be electrified, especially not in 30 years' time, which is a relatively small period. Batteries, for example, will not be appropriate for all vehicles, and heat pumps will not be appropriate for all homes. As such, when it comes to priority next step within the UK's energy sector, I am a huge advocate of green gases, particularly hydrogen. I very much view it as the fuel of the future and see the transition to a hydrogen economy as essential if the UK is to achieve its national target of net zero by 2050. Hydrogen also has potential to provide valuable energy system flexibility, helping to manage interseasonal supply and demand imbalances and build system resilience. It also gives us that huge advantage when it comes to developing new technology that's still in its infancy. As UK PLC, we have the opportunity to not just build that better, we're talking, but actually be a world leader, global leader in this technology. It is for this, these reasons I outlined that uh, Europe has already made hydrogen a central part of the trillion dollar green deal and published a comprehensive EU wide green hydrogen strategy back in July. German Germany, France and Netherlands have also made huge investments into their own national hydrogen economies and the UK must ultimately do the same or risk being left behind. And this is one of the reasons I've been lobbying our government for a coherent UK hydrogen strategy and 
I am actually sorry and, and i'm anxious to see the, that these published implemented as soon as possible i believe a national hydrogen strategy will also galvanize public and private sectors by unlocking new investment and resources the hydrogen economy is particularly worth 2.5 trillion us dollars and supporting 30 million jobs by 2050. i'm pleased to be able to say that the uk does have the capability and is in a very strong position to become a world pioneer in hydrogen technology and attract a significant proportion of the global market what we're starting to see now is clearer commitments to hydrogen by the government, which will create market confidence that I think is needed to encourage private investment. Given proper attention, hydrogen could be as important for the green revolution as carbon was for the industrial revolution. Its strengths are in its versatility. It can be used as a feedstock, as a fuel or an energy carrier. It can be used as storage and be applied across industry, as we've already seen in the transport and the building sector. Representing a former Red Wall seat, the link between renewables and levelling up is particularly interesting to me. A lot of red wall or former red wall areas like Rother Valley have industrial heritage, skilled local workforce and expertise to set up and run renewable sites. Importantly, these areas are also those that would benefit most from levelling up. Localised green economies are already playing an incredibly important role in helping this government deliver the regional empowerment it promised at the last election. Investment into regional renewable energy facilities will not only help decarbonise Britain and bolster the green economy, but will do so providing the local investment needed to create jobs and sell up our left behind communities. Hydrogen fuel, when produced by renewable sources of energy like wind or solar, which is still a few years off, but we can get there, is a renewable fuel. And I'm pleased to be welcoming the world's, world's largest hydrogen electrolyzer factory on the border of my own constituency of Rother Valley which has made fantastic investments in the local area and looking to take full advantage of South Yorkshire's skilled local workforce. Ultimately, projects such as this being undertaken by the private sector are representative of the fact that the UK does have the capability to lead the world's hydrogen economy. I'd just like to, to end on and round off by saying that I'm a firm believer that the regions most in need of economic rejuvenation, like Yorkshire and Humber, should be the centre of Britain's green recovery and the foundation of which we build that greener. And more importantly, I have every confidence this government will to make this so. And it's not obviously highly important, but electricity, and there's so many options, but we need to make sure those areas in the north, like mine, these left behind areas, get the full benefit of the economic recovery as well as the carbon recovery. The path to net zero has never been so clear. And it's only with mutual cooperation between government, businesses, and the energy sector that we're going to reach this goal and it's uh, exciting to listen to what our fantastic panellists have to say today. So thank you very much for having me. I look forward to some very interesting and innovative ideas. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you so much, Alexander. It's, it's really great to hear about the ambition of both the committee and the government in, uh, in fulfilling our climate change ambitions. Um, I, I think we'd all agree that wholesale electrification is a fair challenge and that a shift to a hydrogen economy is essential. Um, just to flag to, to yourself and everyone else uh, listening, um, ENA runs our Gas Goes Green programme uh, that is setting um, and, and creating the roadmap of, of how to deliver a hydrogen economy, including you know, hydrogen ready boiler mandates, hydrogen blending within the existing network, and supporting the shift to hydrogen in, in both heavy industry and transportation. Um, yeah. Also, just to flag, this is um, the, the first of a series of events where we're seeking to make us and explain some of those unanswered questions about the shift to the zero economy. There will be future events on hydrogen, uh, we've got a couple in the pipeline already um, that, that we're uh, developing. Uh, we're, we're confirming the, the, the date of the next one, but it's due to be January. Uh, the, that next event is going uh, to be all about domestic flexibility and how households themselves are becoming more active participants in the energy system. Um, and I'd encourage everyone to, to register to attend that or to hear more about our future events uh, with the link that we're going to send around uh, following this event. Uh, for, for those who don't know us, uh, the Energy Network Association represents the companies that operate and maintain the gas and electricity network uh, in both the UK and Ireland. Our members serve over 30 million customers and are responsible for the transmission distribution network of uh, wires and pipes that keep our lights on, our homes warm and businesses running. Crucially, they're also the companies that are building the foundation to a net zero economy. And um, so, so far, they've connected over 25 gigawatts of distributed renewables. They're responsible for picking up our ever-expanding offshore wind fleet to the main network. And they're also the companies that, as I just mentioned, are 
are really at the forefront of the shift to a hydrogen economy too. This shift is reflective of the, the wider transition uh, with, with the rapid decarbonisation, digitalisation and decentralisation of the energy system. The, the world leadership that we're developing in hydrogen, which Alexander just described, is something that we've already achieved in power grids um, through, through a number of uh, innovations such as those we're going to discuss today. Delivering this transition has itself necessitated a huge amount of innovation to make sure that the networks are fit for what is an increasingly changing purpose as we shift away from big, heavy, centralised plants into a much more uh, distributed model. One example of this is the Open Networks project, which we run with our members. This is a programme of work which is helping to transition to a smart, flexible system that connects large scale in energy generation right down to solar panels and electric vehicles installed in the homes, business and communities right across the country. Within that, um, flexibility is central to it. So um, Open Networks recently hit a major milestone with over two gigawatts of flexibility being tendered out in local flexibility markets making the UK the world's largest market for local flexibility. And the innovations driven by initiatives like the Open Networks project make a big part of the shift to what is increasingly being a smarter grid. The networks already use a huge amount of data to keep the lights on as reliably and efficiently as possible. But with the grid undergoing a major transition, this reliance on data, flexibility and smart solutions is set to only increase. What we're here today to talk about is the innovations which are due to play a big role in keeping the lights on in the future, ensuring that grid remains stable as we're ever more reliant upon it. Mm -hmm. The renewables fleet is due to drastically increase over the next decade, with offshore wind due, alone due to double. Added to which, electric vehicles are going to become the norm following the internal combustion engine ban due 2030, if uh, reports are correct. And with the electrification of much of our heating, uh, the role of the power networks is only going to increase. Um, as it directly enables these shifts to act in that foundation. Now, this increase in function and the drastic change in our generation that's powering it has the potential to shift the inertia within the system, which keeps it running stably. For context, inertia is the force that keeps the system stable through the kinetic energy found in the rotating mass of traditional turbines, all of which currently turn in synchronicity with one another. It's currently generated through the large spinning piece of metal that we see in conventional power plants like coal, gas, biomass, and nuclear. And considering how integral these forms of generation have been to the grid, inertia has always been pretty much guaranteed. However, what we're now seeing is that with coal and negligible power by mix, much of our nuclear duty du du commissioning in the coming decades and unabated gas not legally allowed to generate post 2050, alternative solutions will be needed. Crucially, the renewables that we're deploying in the UK, namely wind and solar, don't generate inertia in the same way. So we have to innovate, much as we have with the rest of our grid. The UK has led the world in this shift to a high renewable system. And as we're going to hear shortly, it's continuing to do so with the, continue, with the technical solutions that we'll need to support the transition. It's a real testament to our panel today and the wider industry. We're really paving the way with network companies across Europe, East Asia, and America in particular, watching what we're doing and what they can emulate. And now, before I hand over to Barbara and the panel, it's, it's just worth flagging that um, in addition to the, the parliamentary member holding in January, it's our Energy Networks Innovation Conference uh, next month with Ms. Parteng giving the keynote speech. And we'll be showing the details of that as well in follow up email from this event. So I'll hand over to you, Barbara. Oh, right. I thought we were going to get a little film there before you, you passed over, but thank you very much. <laughs> Honestly, I think um, the introduction there from Alexander and, and Josh has just been incredible, setting the scene for um, the excitement and innovation and collaboration and change that we're going to see over the next um, few years. Um, I, I mean, I, I came into the electricity industry way back in the early 90s um, when we had an elect electricity pool. And for anyone who isn't aware about what that is, it was a um, we'd moved away from the central electricity generating board to um, a contractual relationship between generators and suppliers where um, we, we were able to hold an additional capacity capability of 20 percent over and above what we needed um, to ensure that the light stayed on. And here we are today where we've got prosumers 
what on earth were they? We didn't even have a vision that people might be in their homes wanting to produce energy and use energy. We've got innovators in front of us today who are going to tell us about what their, uh, their businesses are doing to contribute to keeping the lights on. And um, you don't want me waffling on um about <laughs> about me i really want to get on to the to the speakers here and we've lined up three caucus for you um before they they begin i should just tell you about some housekeeping um the meeting is being recorded um, we have a chat function whereby we would like you to um, submit any questions that you might have. I'm going to ask the panellists to, to make their presentation uh, one after the other, and then we'll take the questions uh, and, and go through the answers after they have finished. I hope that's clear. And we've got, um, we've got Daniel monitoring the Q&As. So he's going to keep me uh, up to date with with what you want, uh, what answers you're after. So we have um, David Wildash, who is the senior manager at National Grid ESO, who's going to talk to us about the stability pathfinder and our ambition for zero carbon operation from 2025. Great target there. We've got Chris Wickens, director of grid services at Welsh Power. And he's going to tell us about new synchronous condenser and flywheel technology. And then we've got Mark Borrett, from, who is the CEO at Reactive Technologies. And he's going to tell us about grid metrics inertia measurement. Oh, well, I remember when I was first introduced to inertia at the grid code review panel by Guy Nicholson, who kept banging on about how much renewable energy there was going to be on the system and what were we going to do about inertia. Anyway, I wait with uh, bated breath to hear the answer. David, over to you, my dear. Great, thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, a real pleasure to be part of this panel today and to have the opportunity to talk about stability inertia and indeed our 2025 targets. So, as Barbara's kindly said, um, my name's David Wadash. I work for Nash Grid ESO, um, and I'm the market services senior manager within the team there. So if we just move to the first slide here, um, just want to very quickly give a uh, quick introduction to the ESO. So the electricity system operator, we are a legally separate part of the wider national grid group. And we're essentially accountable for the movement of electricity safely, reliably and efficiently throughout the transmission network. And fundamentally, our primary role is to keep the lights on um, and balance the sick system on a second by second, day by day, 365 days a year. We've also got accountabilities for looking at uh, network planning all the way through to real time, how we configure the network uh, to manage both uh, the generation and demand outlook and the circuits at our uh, disposal, but also looking 20, 30 years out as we look at what are the uh, infrastructure investments that we need uh, to make sure and the infrastructure that we need and indeed the operational services to manage the system of the future. And finally, we design and run the markets for the procurement of these services that which we procure. And one of these that we're going to be focusing on today is stability. Um, if we move on to the next slide, I won't say any more around us. Okay, so um, as Barbara said, we do have a zero carbon operational ambition. So as we know, um, GB, we really need to focus on decarbonisation of the energy system and really help address the ever increasing challenge of climate change. The key element there is to move to move to and lower and even get to zero um, carbon emissions from the electricity system, as well as looking at the other major areas of emissions such as heat and transport. Over the last decade, we've made significant inroads into undertaking that and really started to see a reduction in carbon intensity of the system. However, we need to continue to do more to drive out further uh, carbon from the system. And we really need to think and plan about how we operate the electricity system, enab enabling ever higher volumes of renewables onto the system to, to reach that zero carbon goal that we've got. Where we are as an organization, you know, one of the key ambitions that we have 
is to provide the platform to operate the system entirely with zero carbon sources of electricity by 2025. And that is, I should caveat, should the market provide the availability of those resources for us. Essentially, we want to make sure that we're, we're not a blocker to, um, to hitting that ambition and getting on as much renewables onto the market as we can. This will mean that we need to operate in a very different way to, um, to the traditional uh, model of power system operation um, and really allow us to operate um, generation on an unconstrained or renewable generation on an unconstrained basis. And this is really going to need us to resolve some real key critical engineering challenges. Today, um, to manage safely and securely, we bring on conventional power plants to provide key system and balancing services such as voltage control, inertia, frequency response. What we need to do is transition in a way and make sure that we have the sources of these grid services to allow the full um, suite of renewables to play a um, uh, you know, a meaningful and growing part of, of the overall generation mix. So we really want to, to be at the forefront of making sure that that is a reality. Okay, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so this, I just wanted to hone in and really talk about, you know, how we're going to need to respond to the changing energy landscape. As has been mentioned before, we've we've made significant inroads into decarbonising the electricity mix, and um, the, the biggest change here clearly shown is the the reduction in the volume of coal. And by 2024, that journey will have finished with the with the last coal plant coming off the system. Replacing that um, energy and that electricity generation, we're seeing lots more um, solar and wind and biomass coming onto the system. And indeed, last year was the greenest year on record in terms of electricity generation, and it looks as though we're set to beat that this year. And you may see and notice that in 2020, that significant uptick in terms of the volume of electricity generated from low carbon and renewable sources. That's very much that you know, with lower um, overall demands due to COVID, the volume of sources provided through those uh, areas has increased as an overall proportion of the next mix. So, you know, we've got ever increasing targets. 2030, we would like to see 40 gigawatts of offshore wind, you know, supplementing and transitioning away from coal and gas as we go forward. So, what we need to do in terms of stability is make sure that we find a way to replace the, um, the services that we have traditionally relied upon from thermal, plant, gas, nuclear, and indeed coal. And we need to make sure that we find a way of providing those services, both from renewals, but also looking for new technologies to provide that to make sure that we uh, continue to, to run a stable system. And key, and we'll find out later more from, from Mark around, is our ability to understand inertia and really monitor in real time so we can more accurately optimise the system and procure um, the services that we require. And we'll hear more from reactive technologies as we go forward today. Can we move to the next slide, please? Okay, so to deliver the stability and greens that we require to, to manage a stable system, we need to harness all the available renewable power and we need to make sure that we have those tools. So our solution to this is uh, launching something called stability pathfinders. We've, we've called them pathfinders because these are very much uh, first in world activities of going out for um, inertia and stability services from the market uh, and indeed in our phase one we went out for what is called a zero megawatt service where we're just procuring the inertia rather than the active power so to talk a little bit more around phase one um, you know this was launched in november 2019 under um, the first phase and we've started to see um, service delivered from that this year um, and that was from kruken 
through the tender, we've managed to bring in five new sites to provide inertia across a differing number of technologies um, to start to replace the existing uh, thermal plant, the coal that we're seeing closed, and other gas sites who have traditionally provided that inertia that we need on the system. In total, um, we spent £328 million on that tender round, lasting six years. Um, and we estimate the totality that's going to save the end consumer 128 million compared to the alternative of dispatching thermal generation within the balancing mechanism to provide that, um, that inertia that we required. And just to put a ready reckoner on that, that tend around is probably the equivalent of the inertia and stability services that you would have traditionally seen from around five um, coal stations on the system. So that's been phase one. Um, and as we've learned by doing through the Pathfinder approach, we're stepping through and we've just launched uh, our second uh, stability fan, uh, Pathfinder, so Pathfinder phase two. The focus here is in Scotland uh, because this is a region where we've really uh, noticed and assessed that we require the services uh, that can be provided. It differs from phase one where we're actively, um, we're, we're encouraging um, differing solutions from the cost across the industry and we don't have that um, that caveat that we had in the first phase where we said that it had to be a zero megawatt service so this time we've we've removed that uh, requirement from the market and one of the key areas that we're looking at is something called short circuit level this is another kind of stability service that we require as well as inertia and that's what we're going to procure in Scotland Again, this is a um, you know, large scale uh, contracting round with a potential between six and eight years um, of, of uh, services that we'll be contracting for within those sort of regions. As we mature and we stimulate the market and see new solutions come to the fore, we'll then move into stability phase three. And the concept of that is that that's going to be a, a, a national tender round. And enduringly, like we want to do with all the ancillary services that we procure, we want to bring these markets closer to real time and, and create um, uh, markets for, for the continual uh, procurement of stability services. But that is something we'll build as we, um, as we stimulate the market, work with partners, getting these new innovative solutions onto the system. So, I'll summarise there, we want to work collaborative, collaboratively with the market to bring these new services to the fore. And we believe that in doing so, that we can um, procure the services that we require to make sure that we are prepared to operate the system in 2025 on a zero carbon basis and you know, drive uh, further uh, renewable generation onto the system as we go beyond 2025. At that point, um, I'll draw it to a close and hand back to Barbara. I think you're on mute, Barbara. Yeah, sorry, I muted myself, but I couldn't unmute myself. I think Daniel came to my rescue, or Josh, thank you. Um, wow, that was really, really interesting. Um, I've got questions about uh, following that, but I best leave it to the audience to ask first, um, and, and we'll catch up um, uh, uh, near the end. Um, thank you for that. Um, we're now going over to Chris Wickens, um, who is going to tell us about his new synchronous condenser and flywheel. There you go. Take it away. Is Chris on mute? OK, okay. Yeah, I've just yeah. managed to be unmuted by something very <laughs> um, so, so thanks very much. It's very nice to be here. Um, I, uh, seven years ago, I was a civil servant, so I had a, a little interaction with, with Parliament at, at, at that point, but a few things have happened since. Um, so I'm here today to introduce Welsh Power and what Welsh Power are doing in the Phase 1 Stability Pathfinder. Um, so we were very excited to be awarded a Phase 1 contract, um, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about it um, in a minute. Um, first, I thought if we could move to the next slide, I would just um, briefly 
tell you a bit about Welsh Power. Um, uh, so this is Welsh Power by Pictures. Um, Welsh Power was formed in, in 2004. I know it sounds like a massive company, like Scottish Power. Um, it's not. Um, we're, we're 36 employees. We're an employee-owned business. But back in 2004, it was formed and bought Uskmouth coal-fired power station. So that's one for the, the power station geeks out there. If you've got the picture in the top right, well done. Um, Welsh Power was the, the, was the company that developed and built Seven Power, which obviously been in the press a little bit recently. We're not involved anymore. Um, and in, in recent history, um, we've, uh, I think, really led the way, I think would be fair to say, in, in terms of flexible gas generation. So the pictures in the bottom right are examples of, of gas engines in embedded generating sites. So these are uh, assets that can turn on very quickly at the click of a button um, to top up electricity supplies and, and crucially not have to be synchronized for long periods of time to provide, um, to provide megawatts. We, we manage uh, for several clients uh, 550 megawatts of assets like that um, out of our headquarters in Cardiff where we have our 24-7 ops desk um, and, and similar, similar support, support teams um, behind the camera in that photo. Um, let's move on and talk about our phase one stability project. Um, so Josh did a good, uh, a good introduction here of explaining that as traditional coal and gas-fired power stations close, the inherent properties of their ginormous generators and ginormous turbines that are connected to them are lost from the system. So the project um, that we're now building in South Wales um, really directly adds that back without providing any megawatts. Um, and I'll, I'll just talk you through the main components. So this is a pretty picture provided by our, our, our EPC contractor. Um, the, it, it's the, the main component is referred to as a synchronous condenser. So that's not generating any power, that's actually using a little bit of power to keep it spinning. Um, uh, and, but in all, the best way of thinking about it is a combination between a very large generator and, and a very large flywheel. Um, and, and that's really exactly what it is. So it, it's like the big generator that you used to have in your coal-fired power station or your gas-fired power station, except there's nothing driving it. It's actually using a little bit of the electricity um, from the grid uh, to, to keep it spinning. Um, the next component I'll, I'll highlight in here is the, is the middle one, the flywheel. Um, so the synchronous condenser on its own has quite a lot of inertia. Um, but the way to really increase that inertia is to add a flywheel. And, and that isn't anything too much more complicated than exactly what it sounds like. It's a, it's, it's a relatively big, relatively heavy piece of metal spinning at synchronous speed, 3000 RPM. Um, and there's a lot of energy in that. Um, and I'll, I'll go on to that in, in a minute. Um, we've got some other, other things I just briefly talked through here. You need a system to start it. Um, so that's, that's also inside this industrial facility. Um, there's a step up transformer. So this, this facility is connected to the distribution network at 132 kV. Um, and, and the step up transformer is the thing that steps the voltage down to, to, to the machine terminal voltage. Um, there is a lot of energy in this and, and it, you know, the potential for something to go wrong is, is not really worth thinking about there's that much energy. Um, so there's completely redundant safety critical control and protection equipment um, that in, in this facility are in, in containers, containerized solutions so they can be built in controlled environments. Um, uh, outside the, the main plant building. Um, so that's a, a, a fairly detailed look at what we're building um, and, and other people have already explained why we're building it. Um, on the next slide, um, we have a, a, a picture that the, um, if we can move on to the next slide. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure the, the, the Welsh tourist board are, are particularly going to thank me for the, the, the picture on the screen, but this is the, the, the live scene as well, live as of about three weeks ago, seen on this site in South Wales. So, so construction work has, has very much started. Um, in terms of what this facility does, it provides about 1% of Great Britain's inertia requirement. 
Um, and I can be more specific. It, the, the facility is going to provide just over 1.1 gigavolt amp seconds. Um, and I think National Grid, uh, David can correct me, but would, would, would often say that uh, 110, 120, 130 um, uh, uh, gigavolt amp seconds is about what they need in inertia terms to, to, to keep frequency stable. Um, it's also been completely developed uh, or, or the, completely, um, it, it went through its final investment decision during lockdown and it continues to be built uh, in, in, in South Wales. So they've actually just come out of their fire break. Um, but, but construction continues despite COVID. Um, uh, I thought it would be worth mentioning the, the, the red wall actually. Um, so we're supporting, this, this facility is supporting highly skilled jobs in South Wales, that's where Welsh Power is based. Um, as it turns out, it's some red wall seats um, that the, the, the technical people um, at various contractors are actually based in. Um, so there's a, this, is, this is on message um, as far as the, uh, the, the, the red wall and building back better um, narrative is concerned. Um, and I'm not sure I have a, I'm not sure, do I have another slide? <laughs> Yes, I do. Okay, importantly, I, I thought I would use my in inverted commas soapbox to, uh, to, to, to make a few observations. Um, I, I guess when we talk about operating the grid in a zero carbon world, that, that, that fosters some sense of uh, a challenge or it's not possible. Um, my first message would be to say, don't worry. Uh, and, and, and frankly, build all the renewables you want um, I think the industry collectively have got operating the electricity network stably um, covered. Um, that's not to say there isn't a lot of hard work involved to get there. Uh, there, there will be a lot of hard work involved to get there. Um, but, but I think the industry collectively has got the challenge covered. Um, the second point I wanted to make was that, uh, and, and you know, quite often it's not uncommon that National Grid gets a bit of a bashing, um, but to their credit, they are absolutely leading the way globally on this stability initiative. Um, and I think they are the example to, to, to transmission system operators around the world. Um, and, and even to, to just really stress that point, I think the, the idea that, that actually I'm not aware of any other system operator following so far, the idea of publishing solution neutral requirements and letting the private sector come forward with solutions, as we've done, but, but other people may have different solutions that achieve the same requirements, um, is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, so, so, so credit to National Grid, I, I think they're doing a very, very good job in this space. The third point um, is, is, is one that is, is a sort of in, in, in many senses, as an engineer, less interesting to talk about than the, the, the innovative new equipment that's being installed. Um, this, I think, is in danger of being another area where regulations are going to struggle to keep up with the, the pace at which the industry operates. Um, so there is a key role for Bayes and Ofgem here. Um, the, the technologies don't sit very well in the current, the current regulatory framework. I, I'm, not, I'm not the expert on that, but I do know enough. Um, to, to know that there is some challenges in, in that respect. Um, and that is really important um, because I think fundamental to this whole competitive approach and best value for consumers is making sure there is a level, level playing field. So there isn't a playing field that's sloped in favor of you know, transmission owner monopolies. So, so, sorry, just to sort of say it how it, it perhaps is at the moment or how I, I see how it is at the moment. Um, but if, if done right, I think uh, you know, National Grid's approach and the private sector's innovation will, will totally have this covered. Um, so hopefully that's a positive note to, to hand back to Barbara. Yes, yeah. that was very interesting. Thank you. And it was good to see that your contractors are all socially distanced in that photograph. So well yes. done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, the audience that, that uh, all of you out of there, I hope you're thinking about um, some suitable questions to pose after we hear from Mark. Mark Borrett um, from uh, Reactive Technologies, who's going to tell us about grid metrics inertia measurement. Over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, and I guess uh, having heard 
from David and heard from Chris, we sort of sit in between the two, really. So um, for us, the area that we operate in and the, the value we add in this whole energy transition uh, equation is to provide visibility on stability. So um, what, what happens, and as Chris showed with his uh, really nice diagram of, of what makes up a um, an inertia, uh, so zero, zero megawatt uh, inertia service provision is um, that there are there is physics at play um, and and really inertia and the change of inertia is down to a changing in physics of the grid. So um, Daniel, maybe if we could go to the next slide. Wanted to come up with. Yeah, you can increase it or is it for me? There we go. So. Um, you've heard a bit about inertia. Um, it's one of these very niche topics that lends itself to very weird and wonderful analogies. Um, the, the simplest one I can come up with is a child's spinning toy. Uh, and you would know the difference if you spun a, a heavy metal spinning top versus a very lightweight plastic one. The heavy metal one would continue spinning for longer. That's because it's got this store of rotational energy and that is very much analogous to how the power system um, operates uh, in the you know maybe 10 20 years ago um, we had uh, predominantly thermal generation uh, we've talked about this these large spinning masses those stored up rotational energy in the power system as we transition into a cleaner greener um, power system that everyone wants the physics do change. So as those large coal plants get decommissioned, as we heard from David, um, that rotational store of energy that they provide leaves as well. And when you are then replacing those with um, DC connected inverters, typically, um, those really only respond to weather. Uh, they don't respond to how the power system is actually operating at that given moment in time. And that basically plays out in terms of how stable the system frequency is, which is the one of the core requirements of National Grid as system operator to maintain this frequency within relatively tight bands around 50 hertz. In a higher system, if you have a power station failure, yes, you get a drop in frequency, but it's relatively small and you have time to react. And in that scenario, you can think of the power system as really like a large steam train. It can just keep on running. Um, as, however, you move to a less inertia um, heavy system um, and into more of a low inertia environment, when you have a power station failure, for example, frequency falls further and faster and you have a bigger hole or effectively national grid has a bigger hole to pull it, pull the system out of, which means that um, the system starts to become more complex and more costly and you need more resources to bring the system back to its normal operating mode. And that's really at the heart of this. Um, so maybe we can go on to the next slide. So that is, I've just covered what is stability, what is inertia. The next thing is really the visibility of inertia. Where does it exist? Um, so again, Daniel, if you could increment it through. Um, inertia predominantly in the transmission system. National Grid has full visibility. Three large scale generator is connected through the SCAR system. However, um, there is inertia in the distribution Again, synchronously connected pumps. But the issue here is that um, that is the room, unfortunately, of National Grid and the operation of a somewhere in the country is, is hard to see. It has great visibility of what's connected in the transmission grid limited visibility of what happens in the distribution grid. And again, as we transition from the past to the future, the inertia that's in the distribution grid starts to become equally important. 
ultimately more important than when you had a system predominantly based out of transmission connected assets. As a result, in the control room, you have to estimate. If you can't directly see it or measure it, you have to estimate at what that inertia contribution from distribution connected assets is. And as a result, that starts to bring in errors which equally carry risk and cost for, for National Grid. So again, if we could go forward one more slide, please, Daniel. What this actually turns out to be, um, if you could increment it once, um, from National Grid's perspective in the control room is a bit like looking at the road ahead through a windscreen that is covered in water you're not really, really sure how much inertia you have because uh, although you can see a lot from the transmission grid, that is reducing and you don't really know what's on the distribution grid. And I think by being able to measure inertia accurately for the first time is a bit like having windscreen wipers. You can see clearly what's ahead of you and that brings some key benefits. So again, Daniel, if you wouldn't mind, you can integrate more renewables and potentially also curtail less renewables because you know how, how much inertia is on the system more accurately. That means the services you procure, you can buy the right services and deploy them at the right times. And I think that stability pathfinder that, that Chris obviously went into detail and, and David shared is really part of that same, same initiative that you can now do with more certainty and you can create these markets that really provide more economic services for the power system. Um, and I think there's just two more points, please, Daniel, to click through. You can manage system risk better because you know what you're dealing with. Um, and ultimately, that means you can achieve savings in terms of the cost of running the system. So um, where reactive fit in, if we could go to the next slide, please, Daniel. Um, we are a, I would say, technical company, we're an energy technology company, and we have had a breakthrough um, that was done very much in partnership with National Grid. Uh, if you could increment it one more, please, Daniel. So um, in 2017, we did a joint project with National Grid where we uh, proved that we could measure inertia, which, uh, again, is a topic a bit like the Higgs boson, this sort of quite... Um, you know, intangible uh, concept to, to think about, but it is a physical property. And up until this point, um, it was something that wasn't able to be fully measured across the whole power system. And we were able to prove that that was now possible with our technique. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, I will explain that technique. Um, so the way we measure inertia in the UK system is very much akin to a sonar system, but different. So with sonar, you send out a, an acoustic wave or an ultrasonic wave and you wait for it to be reflected. Here, we're not sending out an ultrasonic wave. We're sending out a pulse of power, a relatively small pulse of power, typically in the order of five megawatts. Um, but that pulse of power transfers itself through the entire UK system. And what we then have is a range of measurement devices across the UK, from the north to the south to the east to the west, which are then able to physically measure how the power system has coped with that small stimulation that we've given it from our modulator, which in this case is a ultra capacitor or a super capacitor. So we're physically shaking the power system in a tiny, tiny way that from in the control room would look like noise. But then with our measurement devices that are highly accurate, they see how the power system has reacted to that stimulus that we've given it. All those measurements get transferred into our cloud and our cloud then comes up with a national figure for inertia. So in the bigger uh, gigawatts per second typically and these are then passed into National Grid's control room through an API, a, a software interface, so that in the control room National Grid now have what is the game changer from their perspective is a continuous measurement. This isn't something that randomly or sporadically happens, this is now something that is continuously feeding that live 
accurate view of how stable the power system is, which suddenly means that they have a clear view of how to optimize the system, as, as David mentioned earlier. If we could go to the next slide, please, uh, Daniel. So this is to sort of, again, try and bring it to life a bit for everyone. Um, if you could just do one click, please, uh, Daniel. So what you see is a yellow line, and that yellow line is basically the input that National Grid gets from the transmission connected assets. So this is summing up all those large power stations, knowing what they're producing, knowing the rating of those machines, and coming up with an aggregate figure of how much inertia is from or based or coming out of the transmission system. Then, in order to calculate what may also be on the distribution to get a view of the full picture, if you could increment it one more, please, Daniel, there is an estimate made to get to what could be on the distribution system. And that is basically then in the current state of the art for National Grid, how stability is determined in terms of an operational sense. So National Grid operates somewhere between the red line and the yellow line, depending on um, you know, their view of certainty about, uh, about how confident they are of the estimates in the distribution system. The blue line is our measurement data. So again, if you could just click it on one more time, please, Daniel. So this is now our data that is then fed in. And as you can see, in the main, the blue line is above the red line. So, so what we were able to show National Grid when we um, were doing our, our measurements uh, on the UK system is that sometimes uh, and quite often there is more inertia on the system than uh, National Grid would actually estimate in the control room, but not all the time. And just as it's important, sorry, was someone asking a question? No. Nope. Oh, okay, it's maybe feedback. Um, so what, what's important here is that um, by having a real measurement, uh, National Grid can be more confident in their actions in the control room and can take, I guess, better steps um, to optimise uh, the, the stability on the system. One thing that happened whilst we were um, going through this, I guess, pilot phase with National Grid is that there was a power station failure. And if you could just press the button one more time, please, Daniel which um, allowed National Grid to take an estimate, or a measurement rather, of the inertia on the system. And as you can see, the, uh, the measurement that they were able to derive from that power station failure coincided um, pretty much spot on with where we had measured uh, inertia to be. So what we've been able to prove is that this system is highly accurate in terms of measuring inertia, but the key thing is it's a repeatable, continuous measurement that just gives that full visibility into the system operator to basically make the right decision. So rather than feel that you're approaching the edge of the limits of the system, by measuring it, you can see you have a bit more room. And so that may allow less renewables to be cut or, or larger scale power stations to be um, downloaded a bit so so you can start to see how being able to measure rather than estimate gives national grid a new capability in terms of properly navigating this renewable energy transition if we could go to the next slide please daniel um you don't have to just take my word for it david i'm sure you know finton very well um, uh, last year, Finton did a bit of an offence, not an offensive, but went on into the, the media and sort of shared a bit more about inertia to sort of, I think, make people a bit more aware of the topic and why it's really important prior to the pathfinders starting to come out. Um, but inertia is at the heart of the renewable energy transition. It's fundamental. It drives how the power system responds based on stresses and strains that come about through its daily operation. Um, if we could go just to one more slide, please, Daniel. Um, in terms of value, what does this actually mean for UK taxpayers? Well, 
this is this is public data. These are the uh, these are the, the the costs, I guess, of managing the power system, the UK power system, as inertia declines. As you can see, there's an inverse relationship. As as inertia declines, the costs of managing the system go up. That's that's not a surprise because it just becomes much harder to manage the system. You need more interventions. Um, but in terms of the value uh, with National Grid, they would estimate that being able to measure inertia would allow them to improve their estimation by 10 percent, which would mean that, um, you know, on a conservative basis, that may save 14 million pounds a year, which over um, the, the length of our uh, first contract with National Grid should achieve a saving to UK energy users of over 70 million pounds. Obviously, as costs go up, that £14 million may go up. And if we base it on last year, it may turn into a saving of over £100 million. So this is a real, uh, I would say, sizable contribution to the renewable energy challenge. And it ultimately enables savings for UK energy consumers, which I think is also critical. Um, just the last, the last slide, please, Daniel. Um, one more increment. Um, I don't want anyone to think that this is somehow a UK only problem. Um, yes, we're seeing it in the UK. That's a function of being an island. Um, but also, I would say National Grid are absolutely at the forefront of this. And um, as Chris mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, uh, giving praise to National Grid for publishing the requirements, uh, National Grid are without question ahead of the pack globally in terms of looking at inertia and taking positive steps to manage it more effectively. Um, uh, many other system operators around the world are looking at what National Grid are doing and they're using the, the, the approaches that National Grid are taking to basically inform their choices uh, as they go through this renewable energy transition themselves. Um, and there are some countries that are in, in you know, very serious, serious states. Australia um, is, is suffering great challenges from, from lack of inertia, lack of system strength. But it's any, any power system that is going through that renewable energy transition is faced with the same physics. No one is, is immune from this. And from reactive standpoint, having such a world class uh, lead customer such as National Grid has enabled us to to engage with many system operators now around the world. Um, and we see this really as a, as a UK success story. This is a, this is a UK innovation um, really about, I think, any uh, applicable to any uh, country going through this renewable energy journey. And so it, it's and National Grid have been incredibly supportive and very open to share their experiences with other system operators around the world. So they really do need to be applauded for that. So um, I think I just had a final slide, Daniel, just on uh, us as a company. Um, we are a slightly hybrid business. We are a UK uh, company, but we also um, have a Finnish uh, side to us. We have a R and D team in Finland. Um, and our core goal is to deliver, deliver services that can help the renewable energy transition. We've built now quite a, an, an exciting portfolio of technologies. Inertia measurement is at the core. Um, but as, as I said, we're now uh, starting to operate on a global basis with many other system operators around the world and see the challenges they're facing are much the same as National Grid. But... National Grid is absolutely at the forefront of, uh, of taking the right steps to, to make the transition as, as possible um, and, as, and as effective as, as they can. So that was my short presentation. And I think over back to you, Barbara. Thank you. It was really, really interesting. And it's great to see, um, you know, the fact that you've tested it out in anger and it's been proven to work um, alongside a partner like National Grid um, and we'll be able to take it forward from there. That's super. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so we will go to the Q&A session um, and Fernando Morales 
you're really burning yourself out there. You've got a few questions um, in the chat line. Um, if anyone else has any, please, please do add them in there. Um, so I guess the first one, um, Fernando is asking, is about pro procuring inertia and then short circuit levels separately, um, limiting revenue streams for innovative solutions um and limiting development for an innovation um should i come to um david and ask whether this uh looking at a bundled approach is something that you're thinking of maybe for that third phase of the program sure so i, I think the the long and the short as as hopefully i i articulated is that you know the name pathfinder this is learning by doing you know yeah. as, as chris and mark have um helpfully pointed out you know we we are at the forefront and the vanguard of looking to procure the stability services that we that we require to you know bring further renewables onto the system in in um pathfinder phase one that was just for a inertia service however the one that we're running at the moment in scotland we are looking and we do value both the short circuit level and indeed inertia so we are looking when we assess um, any bidders into that tender, um, the, the dual value of both those elements, uh, predominantly on the short circuit level for, for, for the Scottish um, Pathfinder, but there is value that we derive and accrue from the inertia as well. So I think to, to your point, Barbara, when we look at phase three, absolutely, we're learning by doing as we step through these. We want to transition to a fluid market for, for stability and, and all the um, subcomponents which sit underneath that and uh, certainly is part of phase three. Again, like the others, we will be consulting with the industry and potential providers to really understand what solutions uh, and technologies and, and innovation are out there for us to uh, get access to. So absolutely, it's something that we'll be looking at. And I'm, I'm assuming if you haven't come across Fernando before, he's keen to speak to you. Um, sure. so, <laughs> so between the two of you, perhaps you should reach out and have a bit of a chat. No problem, <laughs> we'll do that. Um, uh, Mark or Chris, have you anything to add to that? I don't. I think I think David did it um, yeah. particularly well. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, okay. So Roger Hollies um, is asking Chris a direct question here: whether you could explain why they are looking to install both flywheel and synchronous condenser rather than just one technology type. Um, would you like to take that question away, please, Chris? Yes. Um... And it, it follows on from David's explanation just there. So stability phase one was all about inertia. Um, and therefore, the, the, the solution that we brought forward, um, how we responded to the requirements that were published, was to, to try and provide as much inertia as possible. Uh, and the way to do that, we felt in, in that instance, was to add a flywheel to the synchronous condenser. The synchronous condenser on its own um, would provide I'll get the numbers wrong, about a third of, of the inertia that the whole system can provide. So by adding the, the, the flywheel, you, you, know, you become much more competitive in, in a pounds per unit of inertia term. Mm -hmm. OK, hopefully that answered your question, Roger. Um, we have one here from Geoffrey Douglas. If the stability value of inertia is a means to dispatch power with a low ramp cost, what is the justification for procuring inertia to the exclusion of other technology? Uh, for example, eChem Energy Storage, which can provide the same grid stability service. Who wants to take that challenge? I don't, well, David, if you want to have a go, I don't mind having you go. So you, you carry on, start with Mark. <laughs> so I would I would answer it. I mean uh, I I'm not familiar with. Um, I guess we're, we're talking about storage. Why do why don't why don't things like batteries just um, replace this sort of re re reducing inertia on the system? The challenge you've got is is that as inertia drops, your um, frequency stability becomes less and less stable which means that smaller changes in that power imbalance on the system have a big effect on frequency. So if you're not careful, 
the system becomes, um, you know, much, you have low inertia on the system. If you have too much storage, it can actually hunt itself. It can respond to a low frequency event. But if there's not enough inertia and you've got too much storage, it can actually then create a high frequency event. And then it can respond to that and pulling it down. And so it starts to cycle. So you need to make sure that A, you can accurately quantify the inertia you have on the system, and then B, size the assets that respond and the nature of the response so that you're not actually creating a secondary problem to the one you're trying to fix. So storage is, is definitely part of the toolkit, but it's not a panacea by a long chalk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, David, did you want to come in on that one? Or? Yeah, I, I think j just, just to add to that, and it's just to reiterate something that Chris uh, highlighted within his uh, quick presentation, the, the way that we try to position these pathfinders is by articulating what our requirement is. You know, we, we are solution neutral. Uh, we try to be as much as we can. So we say what we need. Then we look for expressions of interest from the market to understand what technologies, what solutions are out there. And then they, we will look to assess each of those. Can they provide the services that we require? And then we move through to a commercial assessment of those. So. If there are solutions that individuals think are out there that we should be looking at, then by all means, uh, you know, you should be engaging with us through these processes so we can understand what the art of the possible is. We don't have all the solutions. That's why we're very keen to work with the industry and partners to, mm -hmm. to bring these new solutions like uh, Welsh Power, like reactive technologies. Yeah. Is it right to add something as well? Um, yeah, I, I, please. I think, I, I mean, just to reiterate, I think that point about solution neutral requirements is so important. Um, don't, don't just because we're building a synchronous condenser coupled with a flywheel in South Wales, don't think that is the only way of fulfilling national grids requ requirements. Um, there are increasingly other ways. Um, and if we think inertia is fairly niche, you can get onto some really niche stuff once you start talking about dynamic voltage stability and things like that. But th th there are plenty of solutions out there that you can buy for different requirements. So if, if, if National Grid wants things slightly more towards short circuit current or potentially in the future dynamic voltage support or, or something like that, then the solutions that the market may bring forward may be different. But those solutions are out there. Um, and, and, and you know, I think as an independent power provider or a developer like us, we would try and stay solution neutral as well in that and, and pick the right one for, for the requirements. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, next on the list, we've got Fernando having another little go here. And um, he's been a bit controversial uh, in saying that um, companies like AirGrid and Sony um, and Ireland are ahead of National Grid. Well, I have no idea who's ahead of who, but all I'm hearing is a lot of positivity between our panel members here and um, National Grid actually explaining that this is new ground that we're breaking. Um, and I haven't noticed the lights going off very much lately. So um, well done to everyone. I don't know if you want to come back on that, um, panel members. It's up to you whether you want to pick up on this question. Yeah. I, 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 I don't mind. Uh, well, David, if you want to again. No, you, you carry on, Mark. I'll come <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, yeah. I, know, I mean, uh, we know we know AirGrid uh, and uh, and Sony quite well, um, and and they have really ambitious, um, you know, renewable energy targets. I mean, I think it's seventy five percent of uh, non synchronous generation connected on on their grid by twenty thirty or something. I mean, it, it's a really really ambitious target. Um, and as a result of that, and I think the nature of the of the Irish um, system, which is obviously a lot smaller than the than the UK one or the GB one that um, the National Grid look after, um, they have had to yeah forge and 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 come up with you know I would say also innovative um, service requirements. What I would say is the big difference is that um, with National Grid by actually measuring the problem knowing the problem, quantifying it in a real time way, National Grid have a better chance of buying the right services and making sure those services are the most effective, both cost effectively and impact on the on the actual problem that they can have. Um, so I would still say that from a 
a visibility and from a measure of the problem and make sure the solutions really fit and work, I would still say National Grid are at the forefront. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I guess I, I would just to, to put in my parents worth on that, um, you know, we're clearly tackling some really meaty challenges, but these are not unique to to ourselves as as the PV ESA. Um, that's one reason why you know we recently, and you may have picked this up, we we launched a program called the Global Power, Global Power Systems Transformation Consortium, and that's really a group of some of the uh, leading um, TSOs who are looking to resolve some of these challenges globally. Um, and, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking bilaterally to other TSOs. Um, we don't have all the solutions. Uh, we're ahead in some areas and sure we're behind in others. You know, the, the key for us is to, to, to learn from, from other system operators. We, we are the only one in the, in, in the UK, so we, we have to look to, um, you know, uh, collaborate where, where, where we can and learn from best practice, as well as, you know, help others learn from ourselves. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we've got Roger Hollies who has another question here. Um, and he asks, will National Grid be making the reactive inertia data public? He's looking forward to staring at a screen for as long as it takes to see an opportunity to help his business, me thinks, from the way he's um, posed that question. So how can we help Roger? So I, I think um, to to answer to answer that one bluntly, you know, that's something that we'll certainly look at. You know, I think what we're trying to do, and hopefully many uh, of those on the call, you know, we're really looking to ramp up where we can the transparency of of our, our of our operational data, making sure that's out there, so the best solutions can come to the fore. Um, this is clearly one of those areas where we need to consider what's appropriate and right and possible. Uh, to put it out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, that would be very helpful. I know there are a lot of people out there who really do enjoy studying things like that. And, you know, if it's going to help us all and help their businesses identify um, a niche, that, that would be good. Um, okay, we've got a question here from Ross McLaughlin. Um, there's approximately four gigawatt of new pumped storage hydro proposals in the UK. That's wonderful news for me to hear. I do like some pumped hydro. Best party I ever went to was inside a power station inside a mountain. <laughs> Got to be in with the in crowd. Um, anyway, so uh, all this pump storage um, is due to come on. That can provide a full suite of stability services as well as a long term storage to help balance renewables. These projects can be operational by 2030 uh, with the appropriate support. Um, and would Alexander have a, a view? Oh, is Alexander still with us? Um, on a view on this from a beers perspective. Have we got Alexander with us? Does anyone know? Are you there? He's not there. Right. Well, we'll make sure that he knows that question was posed. And perhaps, Josh, um, if there's some feedback afterwards, we can find a way of circulating that. Um, so, I, I, Barbara, I've got a, a thought on that, if I may. Yeah. I mean, I think it is a very, I think it is a very valid point, um, and and it, it's sort of, and I'm, I'm just thinking aloud here, and this isn't particularly my my, my bag, but if, if if you're talking about renewables procurement rounds as well, um, the, the, we are talking about a difference between the value of something that provides stability services inherently, so take a biomass generator, for mm -hmm. instance. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm solution neutral in, in, in kind of renewable terms, but that, that biomass generator is synchronized, has inertia, contributes more short circuit level than the equivalent megawatts of, um, or the equivalent amount of energy that you get from a, uh, say, say a wind farm or a solar farm um, for that matter. So, so I, I think there, there is something to think about there. I, I don't know, I don't know the answer, but, um, mm. Uh, yeah, it's. Um, I think there is a, 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 a there is an unlevel playing field if you're just competing on megawatts because the stuff that you don't talk about stability, short circuit, inertia is, is, is gets gets forgotten about and not valued. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. Okay, so um, we have one last question. And it is from, oh, we've got another one just sneak in, uh, snuck in there. So, Tom would like to ask Reactive, um, do Reactive uh, see any locational differences across the UK in their inertia measurements? And how does the DC link change the inertia level? Interesting. Good question. So, um, I think the short answer is, is yes. I mean, um, although we're giving national grid um the sort of aggregate national view um we can go more granular and we can start to see you know differing regions um having differing inertia levels um and again that that's not just a uk specific thing that would be any any power system um well dc links obviously with the dc connection um don't really play a big part in inertia but they obviously play a part in the power imbalance and you know when an interconnector suddenly goes down there's suddenly a change to the system um uh, which which then more plays out i guess in the in the frequency impact potentially so um i, I think i think from our perspective um it, it's just another you know component of the overall overall system that our measurements would would take into account but um I guess it would more come into that daily operation and maybe the kind of thing that in the control room you would bid the interconnector down or, or whatever to just manage um, whatever the inertia level is on the system at that time to mitigate for the largest loss, perhaps. It, that would perhaps be more relevant. I don't know, David. Yeah. David, have you anything to add? No, I, I think Mark covered it really. Yeah, yeah. cool. Okay, and then um, we have a question from Morgan uh, directed to Chris, um, and it's very specific to the project that you're undertaking, Chris, so I don't know what you can answer on this one. It's about how you're getting on with the with WPD um, and how are they connecting your project to the network? Um, yeah, I, I, I might not say too much, no. <laughs> um, but um, you know, in the I mean, it seems to be in the business of dishing out praise. But you know, WPD DNOs generally are quite big, slow-moving beasts in in my experience, um, and and Welsh Power doesn't have a lot of experience of um, dealing with with lots of DNOs, uh, including WPD, um, and. Um, Again, to their credit, uh, this is very, very innovative for them. It's very, very innovative for the, the whole of the UK. Um, and th they are um, working very closely with us, which is which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, I'm, I'm, it, it, you know, it's it's great that, yeah. that, that they were even open to the idea of connecting something that's never been connected to the transmission system in the UK, let alone the distribution network. Yeah. Well done. So I, I'm I'm thinking that all of their uh, colleagues are watching and waiting to see how this pans out, as is the rest of the industry. Um, you know, and good luck to all of you. It might not be smooth sailing, but you know, you'll get there in the end because that's what we do, don't we? We make it work. Yeah. Um, and then there's a final question from Frazier, which is um, in terms of five megawatt injection into the network, how frequently is this done to achieve a desired resolution for the measurement? I guess that's coming to you, Mark, is it? Or David? Yes. Um, so you have to take it. Um, <laughs> um, well, it, it's, it's, it's really driven by, it's really driven by um, how frequently National Grid want the measurement. So um, typically the, the duty cycle will be around a measurement every five minutes. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a function of, of what resolution we need to deliver it determines how often um, the megawatts are, are pushed into the network. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, um, I would like to thank all of our panellists. Um, honestly, I've learned something new from all of this, um, which is absolutely great. Thank you ever so much to everyone who 
popped a question on me because it, it's filled in 20 minutes or so and um, there were very good questions. Um, we've lost um, our MP, he's had to go off to vote. Um, we will make sure that uh, he sees that question that was directed to him and also um, I hope we can uh, circulate the slides from the presentations too. If any late questions come in, we'll, we'll deal with those as well. Um, Josh, did you have some things to add just before we sign off? Yeah, just, just, a, just a couple of things from me. Um, yes, yeah, so just like Alexander did flag to us before, they might have to go and vote. So I, I think the process takes a little bit longer nowadays than it used to with uh, social distancing in, in the House, because it's actually mm. in, in Parliament today. Um, I, think it's a, I, I guess from my side point of view, I, I think it, we've heard about how uh, reactive data informs National Grid ESO's decisions on when to dispatch solutions like Welsh Power. I think that would kind of summarise the panel conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've certainly found it really interesting. I hope, I hope everyone else has too. Um, I also particularly like Chris's line on that we can build all the renewables that you want, uh, which I think is uh, music to the ears of our, our friends in generation as well. Yeah. Um, and just to kind of close off from our side of things um, and to reiterate my earlier points, um, we've got the next of these events uh, during January and um, just, just tying up the final date on that on uh, domestic flexibility um, and our big annual conference, the um, Energy Network Innovation Conference is taking place in December. Um, details of both of those will be in the email that we send around to you all after this event um, and thank you all for joining. Yeah, thank you for organising this Josh, you've done a grand job. <laughs> thank you once again. <laughs> thank you once again to our speakers as well. It's been really, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks all. Have a good afternoon.